So right now we are going to have an international trade panel on how can Africa thrive in an international trade with our moderator, Boris Wenu. Dr. Wenu is a former is a former academic from Washington State University who has spent the last few years working in Silicon Valley on tech issues. He plays a large role in providing global access on, broad, on broadband technology, including from many African countries. So without further ado, please welcome Dr. Wenu. Thank you very much for this uh, uh, great introduction, and I'm very glad uh, uh, to be here today. Uh, I don't know how to sit uh, with the panelists after the great conversation we just had, and some of the key issues that we gather here to actually talk about uh, has been touched upon. Uh, I would like then, regarding the international trade, uh, to have on stage uh, Mr. Buko, who is a uh, the CEO of Ghanaian National Petroleum uh, Company. Uh, Mr. Opoku is here joining us from Ghana. Uh, <laughs> Our next panelist is uh, Dr. Seben Dauda. Uh, he's uh, joining us from DC. And uh, our third one is uh, Mr. Simba Rugu. Who's joining us from Zimbabwe? Uh, Mr. Hugo, thank you. say that uh, I think we'll shorten the, the session a little bit to make sure that people have lunch. So we'll make it quick, which means also that when you're coming with your questions, please uh, have them very concise and let them be questioned on the topic. Uh, thank you very much. So uh, I would like to start with uh, Mr. Hunger. Can you introduce yourself and uh, uh, a quick uh, you know, open statement? Uh, sure. Uh, thank you. So, on. One, two, one, two. Yeah, okay. Great, thank you. Uh, uh, first and foremost, it's, it's obviously a privilege and an honor to, uh, to be here uh, with esteemed uh, students and, um, and panelists and participants. Uh, my name is Simbarashi Mungu, and I'm the Chief Operating Officer of CBZ Agro Yield. Um, what we do, we are an agriculture financing entity, uh, which was born out of a situation Zimbabwe has had, uh, which is quite well known globally. We were once known as the food basket of Africa, uh, and then we had deindustrialization for a good 20, 30 years, uh, to an extent whereby we're now net importers of nearly every food group you can think of. All right. So our leadership, uh, 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 came up and said, well, we need to solve for this equation. We are a pariah state, or we're perceived to be a pariah state, so we're not going to receive any funding from any NGO or from any other institution globally. We have to fend for ourselves. And so uh, 
we came up with a program of which CBZ agreed underpins this program where we said we are going to be self-sufficient in food production. Right. And suffice to say, in five years, we are now net exporters or net, uh, we are now producing more wheat than we actually consume as a country. Something that Zimbabwe has never done before, including in its esteemed history. Right. And that's a function of the interventions we made through agro We've increased exponentially our production of maize, soya, and a slew of other crops uh, that make up part of the staple basket of, uh, of food for, for our country. And uh, we have been at the lead of that financing, not only the farmers, but the aggregators, uh, uh, the importers of fertilizer, chemicals, fuel, seed, irrigation center pivots, power infrastructure, really being involved in the entire value chain uh, to ensure that we can actually uh, get that ton of wheat or maize um, uh, per se. So that's what we do. Now, what is the context in terms of international trade? Um, trust me, you know, during COVID, you know, we could not get food into the country. The ports were closed, we're a landlocked country. We could not get food from the rest of Africa into Zimbabwe or from all the other countries whereby we import food from. So we had to fix the problem and localize food production very quickly. Right? It was interesting the decisions that were made by the leadership uh, of our country in, you know, in, in concert with the leadership of other countries to ensure that there was a free flow or increased flow of food uh, between borders. Something that should be happening already uh, and quickly, but it wasn't happening and only was instigated because of COVID. So there are a lot of lessons about quick decision making, alignment of incentives uh, to ensure that this whole borderless issue that we're trying to figure out in Africa actually occurs. So that's just part of the context. And I'll just move on to my other speakers. Right, Dr. Seven, your, your turn. Uh, thank you very much. Um, before the panel, we agreed between the three that actually we would let the Simbas do the, <laughs> tough, uh, the, the, the you know, the, the, address the tough question and speak for us. So, yes, my name is Dr. Seven, and I am uh, uh, the head of um, uh, Agri Catalyst, which is a global development advisory base in Senegal. I'm a former IMS executive director. I was representing 23 African countries there. So that's why I was extremely pleased and interested in what the president, uh, vice president had to say about uh, the relationship between um, Ghana and, uh, and the IMF. Um, I was also a former advisor to the president, uh, Macky Sall, when he was the chair of the African Union. And in that capacity, we were very much uh, honored to have been appointed as special advisor on food security. Um, along with um, uh, Strai Maziwa, the former Prime Minister of Ethiopia, Haile Maria, and uh, Vera Sommer. So I'm extremely delighted to be with you today, and I am very much thankful to um, the, 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 the Harvard Student Association from Africa to have invited me here. And uh, I, I certainly am going to be very brief, since it's uh, just uh, opening remarks. I will have the opportunity to speak more when we have the questions. Um, how can Africa thrive in international trade? I think this is a extremely important questions. And I believe if I were to actually respond to that question in one or two sentences, I would say by properly and accelerating the implementation of the African uh, continental free trade uh, 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 agreement. This is a game changer. This is actually has the potential to put Africa uh, to help uh, develop a trade uh, for African countries. Um, this to requires, of course, a number of reforms to be uh, implemented, uh, key of which is the harmonization of the rule of origins. That's certainly critical, and we'll get back to that. But it also actually requires doing something that uh, Ghana is already doing, which is actually making sure that we set up a proper digital infrastructure system for any other for, for, for trade. Uh, to you know, uh, develop the e-commerce and all of that. So that's critical. And one last uh, thing that I would say is, if you look at Africa, how uh, growth, you know, how its um, uh, GDP has been evolving. Uh, I think um, the president, uh, the vice president, said now we are a three trillion uh, uh, dollar economy. Well, when we uh, Africa was two trillion dollar economy back in 2010. So it took us about 13 years to get to add one additional trillion. But when you look at the projection right now, Africa is going to achieve a $4 trillion economy in 2007, uh, 27. 
So basically, in four years, we'll be able to add one more trillion. Can you imagine, actually, what it offers in terms of opportunity for the future, in terms of opportunity for trade, and how, actually, Africa can really drive international trade going forward? So I look forward to the discussion. Well, thank you for giving us more than a word, actually, strategy. Thank you. Uh, CEO, uh, Mr. Dankwa. CEO. Okay. Um, thank you very much. I'm going to be very brief, especially when I have my vice president and future president. I have to start with saying on all existing protocol. That's what we learned. Um, I am the CEO of the National Oil Company of Ghana, GNPC. And uh, I'm glad to be here in Boston. Um, unfortunately, I look, I'm a little bit handicapped. Everybody's talking like an Italian, and you know, I just have the mic in my hand. So uh, I'll, be, I'll be brief. Um, energy is extremely important um, for any economy. We tell us energy is the backbone of any economy. And um, whatever, however you slice and dice it, whenever you talk about international trade, there is a fundamental energy component. Uh, reason why I believe um, international trade within the African context can thrive is because Africa has energy resources, and not just energy resources, but abundant energy resources. I want to get to the point of defining the narrative for African companies, or African corporations, or African countries. Um, being in the energy industry, we hear energy poverty. Africa has to go beyond energy poverty. There are 600 million people in Africa who do not have access to electricity. At the same time, most of our resources, energy resources in Africa, are being traded out of Africa, most of our oil. As a national oil company in Ghana, not even a single drop of oil stays in Ghana. Every drop that is explored or exploited goes outside. Yet, we are supposed to be beholden to the rules of the West when they describe energy transition. So it's a little bit confusing. The West wants us to develop our trade within because they're supporting the African uh, uh, continental free trade agreement. They want us to uh, concentrate on material intensive exports, but at the same time, we are beholden to the rules of the West, which prevent us from actually developing or using our resources because we cannot jump straight to renewables. So I'll make it very uh, brief. Energy transition is a hot topic, and I want to relate it to trade. And back to trade, until Africa starts to define its own narrative around trade. And with that narrative, when you define a narrative, that means you also control the rules. And you are the person who determines the non-complacency <coughs> towards whatever definition or narrative you have. So until Africa defines that narrative, I don't think trade will thrive within our continent. Uh, a typical example is um, gas. The West has defined gas as a transition fuel. But Africa has so many gas resources which are trapped and stranded. Gas is also a cleaner, much cleaner form of fuel. And it can even become much more cleaner if the right technology is applied. So the narrative of being a transition fuel helps Africa, but it does not help Africa to the max. So why doesn't gas become a destination for, for uh, sorry, why doesn't natural gas become a destination for, for Africa? So this is the way I want us to see trade. Trade should be defined by what we think is important rather than being beholden to rules that limit our supply capacity. Thank you. Well, thank you, thank you, thank you very much. Uh, I, I want to actually follow up on that uh, very quickly and, and say, you know, a quick observation is we are more uh, like turbine motors than actual thermostat. That we don't self set the temperature, but we tend to react to that. Uh, one example is uh, the agreement that uh, we wrote uh, that we were trying to work on. And I want to ask you, each of you, how do you build a narrative uh, around you know trade within but also outside of Africa, where some of the rules 
seem to be maybe just copies of things that are coming from other part of the world. So we want to build our narrative. Well, how do you do that? And where did you start from? Uh, I would actually ask the CEO to, you know, to kind of follow up that. Uh, okay, so so the narrative should be around what is important to you, you know, and the narrative should be cohesive in the sense that it should include all players. Um, we talked about the uh, formal, uh, his, ex his Excellency, and during the discussion, I mean, we've hit on the formal economy versus the informal economy. Right. Um, one big problem for Africa trade is we are not able to develop our value chain so that our raw material can be uh, uh, used or can be developed into a finished product. So you look at most African countries, we send out a lot of raw material, which is then refined by the West and sold back to us. A typical example is oil. We send the crude. The crude gets value added, and then it gets sent back to us in the form of refined products where we have to pay more. So the, 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 the looking, look, looking at that sense, the narrative has to be really figuring ways and working together in order to ensure that we can have a cohesive plan to find areas as an African continent you know, instead of deglobalizing, we should come together and figure ways where we can work with each other. Cocoa, for example, um, you talk about oil, and I always go back to oil. Trust me, I, I want you to bear with me because these folks have experience in international trade. The last international trade uh, extensive class I took was at Fletcher, the top school, and that was years and years ago. You know, uh, so you take cocoa, for example. I've always talked that why can't African countries producing cocoa come together like the way oil countries uh, exploiting oil like OPEC? But the narrative there is you are going to create a cartel. However, when other countries do it, other countries that have a lot of influence, it isn't a cartel, it's an organization of petroleum uh, export countries, right? And they determine the price due to their supply and demand, give and take, of what the price of, of, of what oil should be. Yet, imagine Ghana and Ivory Coast and you know, our neighboring countries came together and said, we're going to limit our production of cocoa and we're going to determine the price. It would not work for us because we have accepted someone else's narrative. We have to come together and force a coherent narrative to help us thrive in international trade within Africa and outside Africa. I hope that answers your question. Yeah, sure. Uh, uh, Dr. Seben, what do you say? Uh, thank you. I would say, actually, that a narrative doesn't uh, uh, develop international trade. A narrative is, of course, important. We need to make sure that we define our own narrative in Africa to really focus on what is important for us. But at the end of the day, a narrative is just talk. What matters is actually to implement those policies that really can help promote trade. And that what matters is also to take advantage of Africa's immense wealth and also actually Africa's geopolitical sort of importance to really impose what, where we want the conversation to be taking place and where we want to go when it comes to uh, uh, international trade. I, I say it earlier in my opening remark. I think the most important thing is really to move forward in terms of uh, implementing the continental free trade agreement. If we do that, what we are doing is actually we are creating a common market for more than 1.4 uh, billion people. We would be sort of uh, attracting so much interest from the rest of the world, and we would be actually seeing the outcome in terms of uh, job creation, in terms of economic activity, in terms of uh, poverty uh, reduction. If you look at actually before COVID what happened, over the past uh, 20 years before COVID, we have seen Africa uh, growing at unprecedented ways. We have seen actually poverty being reduced because of trade and because of uh, the, um, the strong growth that African countries did have. So what it means is we need to really try to really focus on that and try to put what is necessary to for that to continue. What it requires is, of course, we have to face it. It requires strong political 
leadership and so, uh, because that's what matters for policy reform protections. When you talk to uh, some, um, uh, some business leaders actually outside Africa, they will tell you, we want to come and uh, invest in Africa as, as part of the food security work that we were doing. We talked to some uh, uh, U.S. business uh, uh, leaders and, uh, uh, and the administration, and they would tell you they want to come in. But what the key issue in Africa is, is, is first of all, it's extremely difficult if you could use something uh, to, of course, um, uh, you know, have the proper infrastructure to, to transport it within Africa and outside Africa. That's a very critical issue. So we need to really invest massively in infrastructure to. To, to, to unlock those, uh, those, uh, those, those uh, constraints. But also what the people would tell you is there are also barriers to trade, whether it's tariff barriers or non-tariff barriers. And those actually are what the CFTA are trying to also address, especially the, non the non-tariff barriers. Uh, it's amazing. If you look at Africa, how um, uh, we were listening to the Secretary General of the CFTA uh, back in February when he was addressing the African Union Assembly. He said that there are close to 5,000 products being traded within Africa. 5,000 products. If you have 5,000 products and you don't have a single set of rules of origin for trade, you cannot realistically really promote trade. That's not an infrastructure. That's actually something that is you know, a, a regulation. It's a non-tariff barrier that we need to address. And that's I think if we're able to really, actually, really uh, move forward on that, that would be critical. My understanding is out of those 5,000, there is about 88,000, I'm sorry, 88 percent of uh, those products that are now, um, you know, benefiting from a single set of uh, rules of origin. That's what the Secretary General said. This is a massive sort of uh, um, sort of uh, uh, progress that we need to really focus and move on those issues, and so that uh, hopefully it's going to really facilitate um, uh, um, uh, in, uh, trade. Let's actually uh, leave, let our actions speak for ourselves. Not just actually talking and trying to define the narrative and stuff. If we uh, walk the talk, I'm pretty sure the narrative will talk. Okay, so that, that's that's very interesting. I, I will, before uh, Mr. Simba, you talked about the narratives. Uh, I want to actually build on you know your experience in Zimbabwe regarding you know trading and what are the you know non tariff barrier that you actually faced, uh, and ask you, let's say you'll be given, you know, a superpower, like a Black Panther, and you want to, you know, build the, 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 the infrastructure gap that we have on the continent. Where are you going to start from? Airports, roads, and, and where do you start from? Yeah, uh, I think um, the Honorable Vice President, I think you also alluded to it, you know, there are fundamental building blocks uh, that we have to address you know, I'm sure people have read, you know, the hard thing about hard things. Uh, there are hard things that we have to do. We can't set up circumvent building a road, we can't set up and building a port or a railway line. That has to occur. Okay. And when we look at the food equation, uh, you know, we're importing about $55 billion worth of food this particular year as, as a constant. And if you look at the breakdown of that 55 billion, it's majority cereals. So your rice, wheat, maize, soy, uh, as a protein to a certain extent. Okay? And in 2030, that number is going to $110 billion. And if you think at the, about the geopolitical dynamics, global geopolitical dynamics, actually, there is actually no region in the world that actually has an incentive for Africa to feed itself. Okay? Because if you look at farmers in the Midwest, or uh, farmers in France, or in the Balkans, in Russia, in Northern Australia, they are the most protected species on planet Earth. <laughs> All right? okay. They have an outsized influence in terms of political outcomes. Right? And they need a market for those products. And that market is what? That market is Africa. That is the only way the rest of the world can implicitly control Africa to a certain extent by controlling the amount of food it's able to extend to Africa. Right? So that's the way we've got to begin looking at it. Okay? If you look at China, China was recently blocked from buying the largest beef producer in Australia. This beef producer owns 1.8% of the land mass of Australia. Okay? But China is trying to secure its what? Its food supplies. So the only real alternative becomes Africa. Okay? So we have to look at those equations and say to ourselves, fine, this what? 
Let's not be too greedy about this equation. The Chinese need to eat food, right? Uh, we need food. Let's see how we can work together to extract value from these hundreds and thousands of millions of hectares on the ground, both for ourselves and for the Asian continent. Because it is extremely difficult to finance a million hectares of irrigation on the ground in Africa. You're talking about billions of dollars that we don't have, right? And so someone is going to simply come and do it and say, listen, I will finance the million uh, hectares, but I want all the food to go back to my own home country. Simply because the offtake is in China, I've got a triple rated A, triple A rated instrument in China, hence I can raise, I can raise capital at 1%. You as an African can't. Right? So we have to say to ourselves, no, we have to look at blended financing models that allow us to take advantage of that low cost of capital, low capital costs, right? and say, well, you know what, for this to work, 60% of the production has to be consumed in Africa. In fact, your risk premium shouldn't be that much because there's a defined yield curve in terms of pricing, and you're going to make money anyway. So we've got to have the right skills negotiating these agreements with global superpowers. Right? So I think that is fundamentally important. Uh, I'll give you a really good example. Uh, the Horn of Africa and East Africa have had two, you know, two Six Sigma or two tail events. Uh, one, they had a, a bad drought, they had army worm, and they had locusts, and a bad drought. And there was no maize coming into to, to Kenya. The Ugandans, on the other hand, had surplus maize, right? But the Kenyans simply said, no, your maize has got too many aflatoxins, we can't receive it, we can't take it. All right. Why? Because there was some vested interest somewhere in East Africa that had trade uh, arrangements with someone in Brazil to bring in cheap, uh, uh, cheap maize from Brazil. Now, let's understand those dynamics and let's, let's see how we can align incentives so that those who have the power to make those decisions, we can avail better knowledge base, uh, we can we can align incentives so that they can see the value of pivoting towards what? Towards Uganda. So uh, th this is very important. You know, when you talk about global supply chains, it's much cheaper for me to import a ton of maize from the Gulf of Mexico, literally from the Gulf of Mexico, into Zimbabwe than it is for me to produce it in Zimbabwe. And part of the reason is that uh, when you have these international trade agreements, uh, the U.S., for example, will come and will have Monsanto sitting on the right hand. And will say, listen, for us to sign this, uh, for you to sign Agoa or X, you need to work with Monsanto. It needs to be able to sell you uh, seed, uh, uh, this particular variety, which is at a 30% premium to any other variety you find anywhere in, uh, in the world. So you're already paying a royalty, an embedded royalty. So the, it, so the total cost of the production of food in Africa is now at a 30-40% premium to the rest of the world. So, and that is taking off, off the top, all right? So we can't compete with the likes of the US and Monsanto. So we have to find our own ways of investing in the, our own genetics and our own varieties that are uh, uh, conducive for the African environment so that we can produce our own food. So the food equation to me is fundamental and it's multifaceted in terms of the, the interventions we have to make. And in Zimbabwe, we had to do that. In the last 10 years, we literally had to do that because we had no choice. You know, no one was going to come and save us. And I think we nearly have to say to ourselves as a continent, no one is going to come to save us. Yeah, that's, that's very interesting. Uh, one thing that you touched upon was uh, the, the, the other regional agreement or bilateral trade agreement that we have with other parts of the world. And I want to cite the Article 19 of the, the Continental Free Trade Agreement, which basically said, you know, we concern <coughs> any uh, any free trade agreement that we have with any part of the world where we already have a deep integration. We cannot take precedence over you know whatever agreement we have within Africa. So what you're saying is, for example, if African continent already has some agreement with EU countries or you know Latin American countries, whatever we're trying to do with the uh, the, the, the the continental trade agreement would not really prevail. So that's one point. You know, the second one was China does not have a single trade agreement with a single African country. The one that we know today is actually Mauritius, right? And you can, you know, you can call Mauritius Africa or whatever. But what I want to say is how much, how much of the trade, bilateral trade agreement, regional uh, agreement matter 
when you are talking about trading with the rest of the world so that you gain and maintain some competitiveness, uh, uh, you know, within Africa. And I will ask with, I will start with, uh, with Zio, what do you think? Okay, uh, I want to go back to the narrative. And when I say the narrative, uh, I really mean the political will. When I say the narrative, I really mean the strategy before you make the action. So it is important. You talked about existing agreements before the African continental free trade. You know of the Cotonou uh, agreement, right? You had specific clauses laid out. Even as of now, I think uh, in 2020 it's expired. Even as of now, there are some transition periods that are happening. And these agreements, pre-existing agreements that Africa has had with the EU, because of that narrative that we allow to exist, those narratives are going to affect some of the clauses we're putting in the African continental free trade. If Africa does not define what is good for Africa, or we do not find what we need from within, we cannot really have a successful and thriving trade relationship between our various countries. Um, it gets also back to, I, I, I wanted to touch on financing, but maybe I'll, I'll leave that to uh, some of the experts who move a lot of money <laughs> with me across. But uh, I, I believe this is it for now, and I can catch up when my colleagues have spoken, because I know we're short for time. Yeah. Right. Uh, Dr. Semet, you can go. Yeah, so I'm just going to come back to the question you asked uh, earlier about if uh, we had superpower, uh, what type of infrastructure we would be sort of uh, uh, promoting to, to develop trade. I would actually go for digital infrastructure. When we talk about the uh, infrastructure, we tend to think about the physical infrastructure, whether it's the road, whether it's the airport, whether it's uh, you know the like. But at the end, I think in the 21st century now, if you don't have a proper digital infrastructure, it's going to be extremely difficult to really promote the type of uh, trade that I mean, the trade within Africa and outside Africa. I think um, uh, um, uh, His Excellency said it earlier how, uh, with the digital transformation, Ghana was able to boost uh, That's the type of you know digital trade that we really need in Africa that we are not talking enough. When we talk about trade, we usually people think about movement of goods and services. But I think right now, uh, with the type of um, you know uh, digital transformation that we have around the world, the most important trade is not actually that type of trade. It's the digital trade. And if you don't have the proper infrastructure to really boost it, you are actually going to be left behind. Uh, and yes. Dr. Sambay, it seems like we're doing pretty well on that end. Uh, at, at least, you know, if you're looking at the numbers that uh, the Vice President actually mentioned, it seems like we're doing pretty well. Uh, the question is, you cannot move corn from Zimbabwe, from South Africa to Zimbabwe to phones, right? So you need roads to transport there. So if we're doing, and, and people don't really, people don't really get, you know, information or, you know, so I'm, I'm thinking that the capital, you know, the flow of capital and, and information, we're pretty good, good shape there. But then for the, for the goods, right, corn and, and all those kind of things, you need roads, you need Railways, are uh, you need airport? Yeah, go ahead. Oh, I, I, think it's really I, I, I wonder yeah. everybody is choosing who's your superhero Superman, Batman, <laughs> Trump. I mean, I have to take one too, right? Yeah. And uh, I will say, I don't know, maybe uh, Shazam. <laughs> <laughs> but um, I want to touch on the point since everybody's answered the question. Um, I wouldn't say, and I like the fact that you brought Black Panther, so I'll just I was just thinking about this. What was the one infrastructure that made Wakanda great? And we know Wakanda is a fictional Africa, right? It was because they had the fictional metal called vibranium. And what was vibranium? Vibranium was a metal which could store, absorb, and release energy. You cannot have any functioning, well-functioning economy without an energy infrastructure. The energy infrastructure is the infrastructure that greases, is the backbone of any economy, pervades like a better break, pervades into every other infrastructure. So think about roads. You can build your roads, but what do you need to use the roads? You need potential energy, which is diesel. 
You can build an airport. What do you need to move planes back and forth, goods? You have to have energy. You can have your digitization. But what do you need to put your laptop on? Electricity. So in that sense, and I agree with my uh, panelists, and also digitization is probably in our era, in our time, it's the one most important infrastructure that you need. But in order to switch on the engine of digitization, you will need electricity. In order to switch on the engine of transportation infrastructure, you will need fuel. In order to switch on the engine of whatever it is, you will need power. So I will wear my Shazam cape and say, power, electricity, energy. Thank you. Thank you. That's good. Yeah, but I just ask you something yeah, on that. Sure. Um, you know, you uh, ask us to name one infrastructure. But the other infrastructure that I was about to also say is roads. Because if you want to transport goods to the airport, you need roads. You want to transport goods to the port, you need roads. You want to transport you know, uh, goods anywhere, you need roads. And if you don't have, sometimes you don't even need energy. And unfortunately, in some places, you just need to have a pause and then you push it. <laughs> that is true. And, and, and just one last point on this. Ghana is a case study. When we became independent in 1957, our first president, Dr. Kwame Nkrumah, had to deal with a country, first country, sub-Saharan Africa, which had nothing, almost no infrastructure. What was the first big infrastructure project that he put in place? He put the Akosombu down, which was probably one of the biggest energy projects at that time. Through that dam, we were able to use electricity to build other infrastructure and even you know, put on lights for our schools where we were able to advance in technology. Beyond that, we were able to export that type of infrastructure to other countries which gelled us and let international trade within that sub-region thrive. So, your question probably has been answered by this. So, I just going to give an example. I gave this example at, 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 at uh, the conference at the other school last night. And um, uh, we went on a trade delegation to, to Kigali, and we went to Pakresa's uh, operations. And I'm sure a lot of you know Pakresa. They're, uh, they're in East Africa and Southern Africa to produce uh, wheat. Uh, wheat flour, maize flour, all sorts of uh, products. They have a big, very big factory, about a 200,000 ton uh, a year wheat factory. Uh, and I, I looked at the model and I said, clearly a lot of, a lot of this production is going to the Eastern DRC. And because Rwanda alone can't justify that production. And so I said, well, where are you getting your wheat from? Okay. And he said, well, you know, you know, it's coming right now from uh, Australia, from the Balkans, from North America, from Argentina. Okay. And then we actually did a sort of back of the envelope calculation. We said, well, tell me, so it comes through to Dar es Salaam, then it comes by train. I think the train goes up to just before you get to Burundi or Burundi. Then it's transferred to a road, then it's trucked all the way up to Kigali. Right. And I said, okay, fine, you guys are getting your hard wheat. Because in Africa, we, our tastes have, 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 have matured and we like, we like this soft bread. All right. Uh, that doesn't, that's got a very long shelf life. But none of that wheat is actually produced on the continent. The continent, we produce uh, the other type of wheat, uh, which is, uh, uh, it's got less of a shelf life. So I said, well, you guys, you know, you can actually still come up with the same quality of product, but we can blend both the hard and soft wheat. So I can produce this, but because I'm producing it at the moment, and by next year I'll have some surplus. So then we did the mechanics. And we found out that for me to get that ton of wheat to Kigali, I would have it has to go from a place somewhere in, uh, in in just outside of Arare to Arare, Arare go to the border of Baira, get to Baira port, wait for the tide to get up, and wait for a ship that's going to go from Baira to Dar es Salaam because most ships are coming from China and they don't stop in Dar. So for it to stop in Dar, it's going to cost you a much larger premium. Right for that, right? Just but so it hasn't even gotten back to Africa. It was already costing the same as the wheat that has come from what? From Brazil, right? Then it gets to Dar. Oh my God, that's a whole different issue now. And I couldn't even ensure that because they say, well, first loss guarantee, 
risk premium on Zimbabwe, your price date, and so forth, and so forth, and so forth. So the implied risk premium of trading amongst African nations, right, is so large, right, that the global financial institution does not actually recognize you. Right? So because it doesn't recognize you, and you have to play by the rules, by the way. So if you want to do a Euro bond offering or whatever, you have to go and what? Get S and P to what? To come and rate you. Right? And you rate uh, they'll come and rate you and say, well, your sovereign bond, your sovereign rating is X. So by virtue of the fact that you're in Africa, you already have to pay 10, 15 percent. There is someone out there with a negative cost of capital sitting in Germany that can come to you and say, well, I want equity uh, in your entity because I can get credit lines at a negative cost of capital. And what are you going to do? There's nothing that you can do, right? So we have to redefine how we actually look at ourselves from a monetary perspective, right? We here sitting and know that the risk in Africa is not, is not that large. That's why the Chinese are coming. That's why everyone is coming and making money from Africa, right? So I think we have to fundamentally unpack uh, these issues of how we perceive risks. Because we'll come to all these great schools, right? And our finance professor will say, well, this is exactly how you calculate your weight average cost of capital. If in Africa, but have we ever asked, well, what is our context? How do we define those equations? Well, thank you very much, Mr. Zika. I, I, I have a follow-up question, but I really want to respect also, you know, uh, and acknowledge that, you know, audiences also, they have questions. So I'll open up for the, you know, question from the audience, and I will take a couple. We have about 10 minutes to do that. So uh, if you have a question, please stay on the topic and ask your question and finish with the question back, please. Uh, yeah. Uh, Uh, thank you very much. I think this has been uh, an incredibly enlightening panel, and I think huge thanks to the Vice President uh, and to all of you for making the, the trip out here and sharing your wealth of experience and insights with us. Um, my question really is about what we know is the or are the challenges that we face versus what we're doing to address them. And one of the questions that came up on this panel was about the Africa free trade area. You know, you've acknowledged the fact that, you know, sometimes movement of goods, most times <coughs> movement of goods uh, is more expensive within the intra-Africa uh, than coming from the outside. Um, I work within the context of, of Africa uh, for a pharma company and there are cases where to move within the continent, I have to go to Paris to fly back into the continent. So we know this is a problem, and we know that there are steps that can be taken, and I think the Africa free trade area is a fantastic uh, concept and first step, yet it's sort of dragging its feet, and we're not really landing on, oh, we don't have that sense of urgency that needs to, that, 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 that is needed for us to achieve uh, these sort of, opportunities that this can bring. Why do you think this is? And what concrete steps or actions need to be taken to, to bring the leadership together, to bring policymakers, to bring you know, senior leadership like yourself, CEOs, to really take those steps and really move past the conversation phase where we say all the right things, we know that these are problems. Uh, but we really never actually end up, you know, tackling them. And it's not like we don't have the talent or the, the wealth of insights or expertise. All of these things exist, but somehow the inertia is just really crippling, and we just don't see it happening. So how can we break the mold and really take that next step? And what, what, what needs to be done to achieve it? Thank you. I'll collect two more questions from the back to the back. So there are two hands here. Uh, okay, this is... uh, hello, thank you for the discussions. I want to build off of the question that was just asked. And if we're talking about capital, we should talk about people. I believe labor, labor is an important uh, aspect. And if we're talking about reimagining Africa, how are we rebranding our people to change the perception of outsiders? so that we don't have people migrating to other countries for work. 
And uh, just to drop <laughs> data here, I just realized that 14% of uh, Africans are responsible or contribute to global migration, which is far less than Europeans, which is 41%, and Asians, which is 26%. So I believe we can add value if we integrate people into uh, the trade agreements that we are talking about today. So how do we do that and add value? Thank you. Thank you very much. Hello, everyone, and thank you all for being on the panel. And once again, thank you to the Vice President for speaking. So my name is Jean Adolfe. Um, I'm in my final year at Harvard Medical School, but I do obviously have a vested interest in the development of Africa as a child of Ghana. So as you all think of African trade and wealth, how do you grapple with the fact that many of the natural resources and land are still owned by multinational corporations, some of which existed before colonialism and were never expelled. And so we cannot necessarily mobilize the resources found in our own countries as we wish. Thank you for your question. Uh, you pick whatever you like uh, out of those three. Uh, uh, yeah, I'll go ahead and I'll uh, kill three birds with one stone. Uh, Actually, first, even the first two questions, maybe the third one included. Uh, his question was, uh, I mean, the example you gave, you have to fly out and then, you know, fly somewhere in and come back. And you talked about migration. I would say follow the money. Look at where the flights are coming from. Those are the places where money is coming from. Look at where the people are migrating. Those are the places where capital is easier to get. If Africa does not invest within Africa, we will have issues. Whoever pays the piper calls the tune. As we speak right now, 87% of um, upstream oil and gas investment in Africa, for Africa, comes from the global north. It doesn't come from Africa. So when the resource comes out of the ground, who takes the resources? It's the person who puts in the money. And whenever you want to know where the benefits of any particular project goes, look at the origin of the money. And that's why, and it doesn't just go back to the origin, it goes back with the benefits and other uh, uh, additional, uh, uh, the, the generosities, that's what I'll call them, if it's a term, you know. And that's why they call it returns. Profit margins are returns, because when you take out and give the money, it returns back to you. It's very hard for African governments to invest in Africa, because our projects have to be bankable, and our projects too have to, we have to ensure, it gets back to the infrastructure question, we have to ensure that even before we do a project, if we're putting out a, a, a power project where we're going to utilize domestic gas, we have to be able to have the infrastructure in place. His Excellency talked about the Electricity Corporation of Ghana, where 30% of, you know, uh, or the same amount was being shown all over, right? So it gets back to the point. I just want to say we have not done a good job in investing in ourselves. I know we have the African Bank, I know we have the African Finance Corporation, uh, but we really have to come together and ensure that projects are bankable. Uh, it goes beyond just projects being bankable. It goes, it has to do with our currencies, you know, trying to converge them. Uh, everybody has liquidity problems, everybody has inflation, but it's difficult because Africa is totally, and uh, it's, it's, it's diverse, but it requires more effort than we're putting in. That is the bottom line. Um, of, I guess that answers your question. And then with the, with, with, with the healthcare, I'll just pass it on to uh, my colleagues over here. Yeah, yeah if the other two uh, panelists, you may also follow up with uh, your closing remark at the same time, and I'll be commanding to Mr. Dostoevsky. Sure. Um, uh, I just want to ask, ask you the question about what can we do? So, the operate, so how can you operationalize 
all these ideas, great ideas, great talks, great conferences. Uh, we've been having them for a very long time. I've been a participant for many years. Uh, but what can we do on the ground? And I always look at this in, the, in this case. These are all optimization problems, right? What is happening on the continent right now? It's very simple. The Chinese are coming in. They are mining. Uh, they're, taking, uh, they're taking oil and mining and taking back to China. That's what's happening. Right. And that is the reality of what's happening at the moment. It doesn't matter which trading entity, which mining entity, Canadian listed, TSX, ASX, Australian listed entity is mining, that commodity is making its way back to China. Okay? Uh, in fact, that Australian entity or ASX or TSX entity is literally a middleman. That's what they are at the end of the day. So that's number one. So number one is, well, how do we not only cut out the middleman, but how do we say to ourselves, well, you are mining chrome from this particular area, right? Uh, you will need to buy, you need to build a railway line and a road to transport this crop, okay? Because the food that we require, unfortunately, uh, is not in, there's not enough of value in food. It's a little more to, to justify the building of roads and, 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 and railway line. It costs plus or minus a million US dollars a, mile, a kilometer to build a good highway, okay? But mining justifies that. So we have to have blended financing models that say, listen guys, it's fine. You, you can take out the coal, you can take out the uh, chrome, but this is the road that we need. We then have add-ons to go into particular areas that are of interest to us as Africans. All right? And you know, I worked on a transaction recently whereby uh, probably after the second largest steel uh, uh, project is being built in Zimbabwe at the moment. And the financier came and said, well, you know, I need a, uh, I don't know, 100 or 1,800 kilowatt line for 800 to 700 kilometers. I want it financed, okay? And we then worked on it and said, well, fine, you can do it as long as you're going to have substations and transformers to feed into the farming communities around that main line, okay? And, of course, they agreed. Uh, on the back of the back, back ability of that Chinese entity, which is this uh, in Shanghai, right? So this is the way we've got to begin thinking about uh, uh, the Chinese, then being more of a partner rather than an adversary, and us getting what we want from every transaction that they're having on the continent. So, I, thank you. Um, I think we agree on one thing, is that we need to address both tariff and non-tariff barriers to trade that are hampering uh, intra-Africa trade. Um, uh, as part of those non-tariff barriers, we talked about also the regulation that needs to be addressed. The issue is this. Um, when you look at trade, most of the time, you're talking about uh, custom uh, administration being involved. You're talking about taxes, actually, uh, you know, tax revenue being uh, a, a, key, a key issue there. And of course, as we all know, um, there are some sort of uh, vested interests in some way. So basically, I think uh, it uh, was also raised by uh, the vice president. What you have, you have all those middlemen that are also actually involved. What I'm saying is, if you want to address those um, uh, obstacle to trade, you need to reform. And reform is often undermined by actually the, the, those special interests that do not want that reform because they would stand to lose from it. So it requires actually a strong political will and commitment to really address that. But also, and, and we can get back to that, it requires digital infrastructure because once you digitalize your system, then you can actually really facilitate and put some more transparency and make sure that at least you not only have a must cost-efficient uh, sort of a system, but you also really reduce those type of uh, potential corrupt activities that are really lengthening processes and also making things more bureaucratic. So that's critical. But I think we were trying to just respond to the, to the, to, to the, to the moderator in saying this is the most important thing, and that's, that's the most important thing. Right? But policymakers do not have that luxury. They, everything is important in terms of digital and uh, physical infrastructure, whether it is the road, whether it's, uh, of course, the energy infrastructure, whether it is the railway that we didn't talk about. If the U.S. have really, really transformed their economy in the you know, 18th century and 19th century, it's because also of the rail system, railroad system. So that's also critical. It's just to say that all of those type of infrastructure are important, and each country actually have to sort of uh, prioritize depending on its own uh, sort of circumstances. Um, uh, One last thing that I would want to say is that we need to really live with the positive norms. The CFTA is actually extremely ambitious and is really moving forward. 
it's, you know, it's going to be the single largest, uh, you know, Africa is going to be the single uh, sort of uh, largest free trade agreement in the world in terms of uh, the number of countries. That doesn't take actually obvious, uh, you know, one day to, to, to organize that. It's going to take time for sure. But what matters is it's really going in the right time. And we need to be very much proud and supportive of that. We in the private sector, we need to work with the policymakers to make sure that really it goes uh, really uh, sort of um, uh, uh, move forward so that we can really make Africa the best destination for trade and for the benefit of Africa and make sure that we can really uh, improve the living condition of our, uh, of, our of, of, of Africans in general. Thank you. Can I steal another 30 seconds? <laughs> so uh, I always you know, remember my professor back in the day saying, trade is good, trade is good, trade is good. Trade is always good. You know, you have a competitive advantage. You use it and use it to partner with someone who can produce something better than you. It's what defines the concepts and rules around trade. And that is what, as Africa, that is what we have to look at. And I'll end this by just giving an example. ESG, environmental social governance, like it's very hard for African companies to compete with capital um, on international stock exchanges or, or uh, capital markets because they do not have an ESG concept. But that ESG concept is a Western concept. I'll end with a true story I talked to one of the energy ministers of an African country, and he said that I want to build a pipeline that will take my oil out and export to bring in money. And I asked, but why are you, why do you want that money? He said, I need that money to develop a coal mine so that I can make pellets of coal to give to my people. And why do you want those pellets of coal? Because I need them to use it for cooking, they use biomass. I'm in a place where there's serious desertif desertification, and there are just a few trees remaining. So I need to develop my coal resources to ensure that my green trees stand up and can, you know, plenish or add oxygen, you know, to, to, the, to the environment. He explained it to me like that, and I said, that makes sense. That's even a better reason of saving the planet by mining or exploiting oil. But if he was to put this in an application for a loan or for a World Bank IMF, it would not fly. Because ESG has been defined through a foreign perspective with a foreign narrative and concept. Change the narrative, change the concept, change the rules, and make trade bespoke to Africa. Thank you. Well, that was... Uh... That was, a, that was a remarkable closing uh, remark, and I would like to, you know, to thank uh, each of you, uh, our three superheroes. Uh, they actually proposed that we actually revise the narrative. If we can rewrite the rules, or at least make sure that we are at the table where rules are written, that would be good for the continent. And as uh, all of us here gathering, I want us to, to leave this panel with, with some hope, but also this, this sense of urgency that we don't just want to talk, we want to move on. We want to get things done. Thank you very much and have a round of applause for it. Thank you.